Good morning, everybody. My name is Jacek Bartoszek. Welcome to Strategy in Future. And today uh, we are having a distinguished guest, Professor Jamie Shea, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Professor of Strategy and Security at uh, Exeter University, UK. Uh, but most importantly, uh, an experienced uh, uh, practitioner of NATO, uh, of NATO strategic uh, perspectives, uh, very active within NATO structures for, for many years, dozens of years even, I, I, I may put it uh, that way, a very well-known person speaking about the future of NATO and uh, you know every, every single challenge that NATO has faced uh, in its history and is going to face going forward into the future. Hello, good morning, Jamie. Good morning, good morning, yes, I can thank uh, very much for the opportunity. So let me let me uh, ask the, the, the straight, uh, what do you think will be the strategic concept for NATO in the 30s in this century? Well, first guess? of all, yeah, the, well, first of all, I think there's a, a need for reaffirmation. Many people think that you know, when an organization like NATO does a new strategic concept, uh, it's replacing an old one with a new one. So everything has to be new. Um, that's not the case. Uh, uh, I think uh, 60, 70 percent of these exercises are about reaffirmation. People need to be reassured. People need to know that the fundamentals are still healthy uh, and are in uh, a place. So, uh, you know, the French have an expression which is uh, you don't need to say it, but it's better if you do say it. Uh, uh, and uh, I think this is going to certainly be the case now because, first of all, we have the US pivoting to the Asia-Pacific. Uh, we saw just a couple of days ago this new deal uh, with Australia, with the UK uh, for nuclear submarines. But it's not just about nuclear submarines. It's about a strategic pact uh, to uh, uh, look at challenges in the Asia-Pacific. We see the US investing more in the quad uh, with India, with Japan, Australia. There was a summit meeting just a few days ago. And we see the Pentagon plan to put most of its new weapon systems uh, as they roll off the production line uh, into the Asia Pacific, uh, particularly the new maritime assets. So I think, first of all, the strategic concept has to reaffirm that you know, this is not going to be at the expense of Europe, that the American commitment to Europe uh, remains watertight. Uh, and there are some uh, additional things that the US could do uh, to bolster uh, European security. I would like to see more US forces, particularly in Poland and in uh, Central and Eastern in Europe on the Black Sea, uh, a greater presence of US maritime assets in the Baltic, the Eastern Mediterranean, the Black Sea, more investment of US electronic warfare and air defense uh, assets as well, and more pre-positioning of US uh, equipment uh, in, in Europe. So, so th this is absolutely uh, crucial. It's not just for Poland and the Eastern European allies, who of course are always sensitive about the solidity of the US uh, uh, commitment. It's for all of NATO. The, the second thing is that Macron, uh, as your uh, listeners, your viewers know, uh, has launched this uh uh, a sort of push for European strategic autonomy. Uh, and I think NATO in the strategic concept has to grip this uh, because on the one hand, uh, we need to persuade the EU, European countries to invest more in their security and defense. Uh, we can see the utility of EU operations in Mali or the Central African Republic where NATO is not engaged. If they fight terrorism there, they're benefiting all of us. But, but on the other hand, we want all of these investments that the EU is now uh, 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 looking at, you know, with the European Defence Fund, the PESCO, uh, the, the common funding, uh, talk of a European intervention force. We want these assets to serve NATO, to serve NATO's minimum military requirements, uh, to also be available for collective defence in Europe, you know, not just for operations in Africa. So we, we have to find, you know, some uh, constructive way forward here uh, in the uh, strategic uh, uh, concept um, so that we stop this kind of endless fight between those who think the future is all about European strategic autonomy and those who believe that this is always going to be dangerous uh, for uh, NATO. This is going to take some intellectual rigor, but, but we, we, we have to do it. The, the third thing, Jacek, uh, in terms of reaffirmation, is uh, in nuclear policy. Uh, we may have a government uh, in Germany after the elections. We don't know yet uh, because the coalition is still being discussed, but we may have, you know, SPD, uh, 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 
ministers, of course, in the government, green ministers in the government. Uh, they may not want to continue Germany's participation in NATO's nuclear uh, burden sharing arrangements. Uh, I think uh, that would be bad for the alliance. Uh, we, we are dealing uh, today with nuclear armed powers, uh, China, Russia, uh, increasingly I Iran, North Korea, uh, nuclear deterrence is still important. So re re not necessarily modernize uh, NATO systems right away, but re reaffirm the, uh, the fundamental contribution that nuclear weapons make to NATO's uh, deterrence as well. Uh, it's not a popular topic, but we can't shy away from it. And then uh, finally, reaffirmation on the open door. Uh, yes, like you've seen recently that a, a number of uh, countries in Europe are getting rather lukewarm about uh, open door. Uh, the EU in particular, when it comes to issues like Albania, North Macedonia, the Bulgarians have been blocking uh, negotiations with North Macedonia. Uh, we haven't given Ukraine or Georgia uh, a firm signal as to the way ahead. The Ukrainians are perpetually lamenting that. Um, and uh, I think this is also the moment, uh, particularly at a time when Russia is putting more pressure on Ukraine, Georgia too, to reaffirm the open door. So yeah, uh, in a nutshell, uh, a lot of this is going to be about reaffirmation. Uh, this may be boring for the think tanks that like new things, but for a serious alliance, it's important. But there are some new things as well. Very briefly, we may maybe go into these in more depth. There, there's clearly you know, the way ahead on China. Uh, you saw that uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg uh, had a phone call, his first ever, uh, with Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, the other day. Uh, so clearly, uh, uh, China is the, the new kid on the block, um, particularly after the June NATO summit. So I think people will want to see, you know, well, you put China on the agenda, NATO. What are you doing about it? What's the policy? What's the approach? Uh, maybe a dialogue on Afghanistan, uh, for instance. Um, obviously, uh, I think people are going to be looking at NATO to develop uh, some of the new programs it's announced on climate change, on space, or on disruptive uh, technologies, the, you know, the so-called emerging security challenges. And finally, it's clear that uh, we need to push ahead NATO's work on resilience. You know, COVID, uh, as well as Russian hybrid tactics, uh, man-made disasters, natural disasters. We've, we've had a lot of shocks uh, to the system over the last couple of months. Uh, our military have been deployed uh, more inside our countries over the last year than outside our countries, you know, dealing with uh, hospitals for COVID patients, uh, vaccine distribution. In my country, the UK, the military are even about to start driving petrol trucks, fuel trucks uh, to the uh, to the, service, the the petrol stations because of the, uh, the shortage of petrol. And I think, you know, given this experience, we need to see how we balance the use of our military assets for domestic resilience vis-a-vis -vis the use of military assets for their traditional task, which, of course, is to defend us against uh, external threats uh, on our borders. So it's quite a large menu, uh, but I think the trick of success is the balance between reaffirmation and pushing ahead with some of the new things. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, building on, on what you have just uh, said, yeah, uh, reaffirmation, building on you know sort of new things and combining both. Uh, you know, if if we take a broader look and take you know and, and view, for example, the uh, the UK investment in being more a maritime power, in maritime assets, uh, even an interest in Asia, in the Pacific, and withdrawing from continental Europe, both in Brexit and interests and military capabilities. And if you remember the old cliche that uh, intention, intentions don't matter because they can change overnight, it's the capabilities that matter. And also understanding the, 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 the changes in the grammar of warfare, that it's more of standoffish, it's more of over the horizon, right? More and more. It's the US pivoting away to Asia and the, the tyranny of distance in the Western Pacific probably will be creating a new model force for the U.S. power projection capabilities that might not be fitting into the European schemes, European plans, which uh, Europe is a continent, right? So it's all about the continent. Uh, and at the same time, seeing that both France and Germany don't modernize the forces, don't reform forces to adapt to the changes, to the major shift in how the warfare is being conducted, why the Russians are doing, why the Chinese are doing it, uh, how would you, uh, you know, sort of consolidate this position and so that the NATO could be reinvigorated 
and, uh, be, and remaining a really deterrent structure to stabilize yeah. the strategic perimeter of Europe. And it's not only about the Polish NATO Eastern flank perspective, just let me, let me just be fair with, with you, is the preoccupation against all perimeters, actually. Europe is not an island. It's a peninsula connected to, to Eurasia and other challenges that are, that are going to press upon Europe and its project of consolidation and NATO as a security umbrella for them. Yes, I, I mean, th this is really the what we used to call uh, the $64,000 question, and you've posed it very well. Uh, I, I think that at the moment, the problem for many NATO countries, and the UK is a good example, is they're kind of split between the old form of warfare, you know, the, the fact that the Russians have lots of tanks, lots of traditional things like jet aircraft, uh, artillery, armoured personnel carriers, uh, hundreds of thousands of troops. So the, And they've shown this, of course, in their exercises like ZAPAD over the last couple of weeks, uh, and of course, the big deployment on the border with Ukraine uh, back in the spring. Uh, and a new type of warfare where we're all worried about little green men uh, and special forces and amphibious operations uh, uh, particularly from the uh, the, the sea um, uh, and uh, you know, threats to critical infrastructure and sabotage and so on and and to some degree the problem is many allies are sort of hesitating between both with the problem that they will neither do a classic conventional fighting nor will they have the high-tech uh, cyber enabled uh, electronic warfare capabilities to deal with the, uh, the, the more hybrid uh, type things. Now, my sense is that NATO has to have a serious dialogue about this because it's clear that when our adversaries in the future are going to be able to hit us with both. I mean, Russia is a good example. It really is able to do both. Uh, and uh, my sort of worry a little bit, to be frank with you, about the UK integrated review is that you're right, it goes for increasing the size of the Royal Navy beyond the 19 combat ships that we have at the moment. So there is a need to do this, particularly for the UK to project power uh, around the periphery of Europe and, and beyond. But it's cutting the army down to around 70,000, which is a, an unbelievably low number, even for the UK, uh, and going back to a sort of expeditionary niche kind of capability with very small units, uh, very good at, at deception, hiding cyber tactics, ideal for hybrid warfare, but the UK UK is cutting its tanks uh, and won't be able to make a big contribution to a battle in which uh, Russia would throw uh, you know, 16,000 tanks at us uh, uh, with massed artillery. So we're going to have to look at a division of labor uh, in the future between those who specialize in the hybrid stuff with those kind of niche special force capabilities and those who agree to provide the heavy stuff, which clearly we still need, because ultimately, if you want to conquer a significant amount of territory, rather than just undermine or provoke somebody, uh, you are going to need the heavy stuff. And our big adversaries of the future uh, will have that. Uh, they will do both. So you're right. Uh, Germany is crucial here because um, you know, during the Cold War, Germany provided the heavy stuff. Uh, it, it had uh, uh, a large number of tanks, 20, uh, which it deployed. It, it had heavy divisions. It had the heavy armor. France also uh, had this as well. Today we have Poland, which also has a heavy uh, army, heavy uh, a, a tradition. Um, and we need to look, if you like, at a coalition of countries in Europe that would really provide the heavy land-based continental uh, armor uh, for deterrence. Uh, um, I, as I said, the United States would have to play a bigger role in this with uh, uh, brigade uh, size uh, forces in Europe, not simply with lightweight strikers, vehicles but with heavy uh, armor and tanks um, uh, and storage and then a group of countries like the UK which would provide maybe the Netherlands, uh, Denmark, you know more of the maritime special force hybrid capabilities and, and see how we develop a strategy that brings those two together but you're right uh, Jacek the, the, the great absentee at the moment in all of this is Germany. Um, it's not spending anywhere near uh, two percent. Uh, it, it's got a plan you know to re established two divisions, but that's going to take some time, particularly with the armor, with the equipment. It badly needs to modernize its, its, its equipment. It has to have a serious dialogue with its own public uh, about the uh, the needs of modern defense. And it has to, in its Franco-German bilateral relationship, you know, based around future
future uh, uh, aircraft combat systems based on you know, building uh, drones with the Germans, and particularly also the future armoured uh, personnel carrier, the, the land vehicle, has to have a serious conversation with France about how it provides, both in an EU as well as a NATO framework, that kind of heavy armour for the defence. So that's the way I see things going. Be interesting to see if the new strategic concept could be the, the time to have that kind of uh, a, 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 a debate, but we can't have a NATO in which everybody, even the big countries, want to provide selective high-tech niche capabilities, but nobody wants to provide the bulk and the mass, the density, which the Russians clearly are still playing with, uh, and which they've demonstrated in, in, in Ukraine, of course, uh, Syria, that they're perfectly capable of using. Yeah, and, and on, on top of that, uh, um, adding to the, 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 you know, the weight of your arguments, is that you know if if we don't see the cohesion in in, in you know going forward into the future in those you know in as NATO as Germany France UK United States countries like Poland will be be at the crossroads then in a way um, for example if we are the frontline state and we see that the grammar of warfare is changing and we don't see the cohesive plan to address it within NATO and sort of reluctance upon the Germans to, to, to act upon it, uh, we will be thinking hard whether to build and modernize to become an auxiliary force to NATO war plan or to field an indigenous force, you know, with, uh, the, with our C2s and so on. Uh, so uh, we are closely watching what is being debated in the Western Europe now, because uh, we we feel the threat that it's tangible, it's around, not a f you know far-fetched uh, uh, discussion, and this will have major co uh, implications for Poland's uh, spending, defensive structure, defense structure, and so on and so forth, and the capabilities uh, that we will field. Yeah. So, so it has consequences, right? This reluctance to, to make a decision is going to have consequences and the Russians may exploit the, the differences between countries and uh, interests within NATO. Uh, my, but but, but, but my, my question that I really wanted to ask you, and there were so many aspects that I wanted to touch is, don't you th think that uh, speaking about future, near future and more distant future, the real it will be china that will decide the real future of nato uh, not being in europe being far away but still this is such an elephant in the room uh, that is making such pressure on the united states europe the rift between europe and the united states and grand geopolitical game over the future of, of the world is that this is China and its role, its perspective. What is China for NATO that might be decisive? Well, again, you're asking all of the top questions today. Um, NATO has got China on the agenda now, which is good because uh, it, it's long uh, overdue. But I think also we have to be very clear eyed about uh, how China is a challenger to us uh, and uh, you know, not adopt the wrong policies for the wrong problem. Um, the way I see it at the moment is that China is a sort of global diplomatic technology challenge. Uh, it's, it, it's attempt to sort of dominate new technologies like uh, you know, bioengineering, artificial intelligence, uh, quantum computing, uh, the 5G, 6G telecoms uh, rollout and, and, and so on. And of course, the big debate about who's going to set the standards for these technologies in the uh, 21st uh, uh, century. And of course, that concerns Europe, it concerns the United States because of of our consumption of Chinese uh, uh, products and the Chinese desire, obviously, to participate in those markets. Now, um, this is not so much in the hands of NATO. Uh, you saw uh, Jacek uh, in Pittsburgh uh, uh, just a, uh, two days ago, the US and the Europeans launched their Trade and Technology Council with their 10 working groups, where they're really, really going to try to sort of come up with a, a transatlantic common way forward on things like supply chain security, technology standards, uh, the whole data data issue, uh, where unfortunately the EU uh, and the US have taken very different positions regarding regulation, you know, sub
subsidies, uh, 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 for example, uh, the whole issue of data privacy uh, and, and uh, also regulation versus leaving it to self-regulation by the private sector. So uh, a lot hinges on the success of this Trade and Technology Council, because if the EU and the US can start agreeing on the common standards, then they can take these forward into the World Trade Organization, into you know, the G20, uh, into other multilateral bodies and really push back uh, against the Chinese and put the Chinese in a position where in order to compete and have access to markets, they'll have to obey the rules and also follow the Western uh, standards, particularly when it comes to an open internet architecture, where which won't be dominated by one company or one state, but where others will have the right to plug and play. But, but NATO, of course, has a great interest in following that debate uh, closely. Uh, it's also work, it's been working, for example, already on a code of conduct uh, for artificial intelligence, like it's worked in the past on norms for uh, uh, governance in the cyber area. It has all of these centers of excellence, so, uh, some in Poland, uh, which work uh, on these issues with the academic and the scientific community. So NATO can certainly make a contribution. So that's where, to my mind, as far as Europe and the US is concerned, the Chinese challenge lies at the moment. It's not yet a military challenge. Okay, yes, yes, okay. The, the Chinese have sent a couple of ships uh, to exercise with the Russians in the Baltics or the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, uh, they've made a few port calls, but, but I don't see China replacing Russia uh, anytime soon uh, as an immediate uh, military uh, threat to Europe. So that means that for the time being, the military dimension of uh, the China challenge is in the Asia Pacific. It's in who is going to control uh, the Pacific, who is going to control the Straits of Taiwan, whether China will, uh, under President Xi's uh, term in office, try to uh, reunite with Taiwan through the use of force, uh, the bullying of countries like the Philippines, Vietnam, uh, when it comes to you know, the uh, uh, islands and the fishing rights and all of that. And, and clearly here you see a determined pushback by the United States. Uh, we mentioned already the AUKUS uh, nuclear submarine deal. Uh, we mentioned you could the, the, the Quad, you know, pulling in the Indians, uh, organizing more maritime exercises, freedom of navigation. Uh, it's not just the UK with its aircraft carrier, uh, but also uh, recently Germany, France, uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, who have all sent ships to the Indo-Pacific uh, on freedom of navigation uh, 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 operations or for exercises, you know, to demonstrate that, you know, Europe has an interest in this uh, 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 together with the United States. But it's going to be very, very important, particularly coming back to our first question about the balance between Europe and Asia, that the United States and the Europeans have a, a, a good dialogue about exactly what is needed uh, to uh, contain, if that's the right word, Chinese military ambitions uh, in the Asia Pacific. Uh, Defense of Taiwan, uh, obviously, uh, it, which few countries recognize uh, is, is a key uh, uh, qu question. But I don't see that as a job for NATO. Uh, I, I think that individual allies who have the aspirations, uh, particularly the UK, because of its uh, alliance with the US and Australia, and France, because France uh, has 7 million, 7 million French subjects uh, in the Asia Pacific and 7,000 troops. You know, France is the only European country with Asia Pacific territories, you know, New Caledonia, Polynesia, Tahiti and so on. So I think it, this is going to be reserved for just a few. Uh, uh, so let's get it right. Uh, uh, it, it's what we need to do uh, in the Indo-Pacific, but uh, for the time being, as far as at home and Europe is concerned, it's about standards, it's about technology, it's about pushing back, you know, like COVID-19 with the uh, Chinese vaccine diplomacy. Uh, 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 it's about uh, having a challenge, which uh, the European Union and the United States have just launched to the Chinese Belt Road in policy, transparency and investments. It's about the regulatory tech environment. Um, uh, uh, and if we can get that right, uh, it's far less likely, in my view, that the Chinese military challenge to Europe or to the North Atlantic will emerge in the future. Yeah, and, and the, 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 we were watching closely what the, the Germans were saying last autumn, a year ago, uh, and we found it uh, quite promising uh, uh, because what um, uh, German defense minister, a AKK, as you say in, you know, in English, uh, proposed and how we, uh, we were reading it in Warsaw, 
was that it's fine. We understand that the U- U.S. has to focus more on the Western Pacific, pivot away, just so we are exporting potential challenge there and you know m- make it stay there without moving towards Europe. But uh, on the flip side, the Germans will uh, will accept more burden, will invest more heavily in, in, in deterrence, uh, will consolidate NATO um, in exchange for, for example, reinforced uh, extended nuclear deterrence, this nuclear umbrella, United States enablers from far away, and so on and so forth. And that seemed like a good deal. But today, it seems that it is the empty air. I mean, I, I see no debate in Germany over that, and it seems that it didn't click. Something went wrong, and it was promising for the NATO Eastern countries, so to speak. You know, um, uh, this glue that United States is remaining with a diminished role, but still the preponderant role, that might make for a good deterrent. At the same time, releasing United States to confront uh, the Western Pacific challenges. Um, still without breaking out the EU and all this, you know, what's good in Europe, continental Europe. What is your take on that? Well, I said earlier that the role of Germany is really decisive in all of this, and they have to accept that they are, you know, a major European military power. There's nothing wrong in this. Uh, You know, their history uh, isn't some kind of fatality, which means that, you know, they are uh, never allowed to touch military power again. But they have this major responsibility because you can't build, uh, for example, uh, a European strategic autonomy any more than you can build a credible NATO conventional defence without the German participation um, that you know the French uh, are not just the Americans have to send this message to uh, the Germans I think they definitely will do on nuclear responsibilities because the French rely greatly on nuclear uh, deterrence and uh, when I was at NATO uh, it was by far the French more than anybody else that took the time and trouble to take the North Atlantic Council ambassadors to the Elong and to French nuclear sites and to invert it if I can use inverted commas here educate them about the realities and the capabilities of of, of, of nuclear de- de- deterrence and so I definitely feel that you know, France and not just the US and NATO has to sort of get this message uh, 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 across that it's for Europe uh, uh, as much as it is for the Americans of course you can't bully the Germans President Trump when he you know clearly bullied the Germans with the threats of removing 12,000 troops from uh, uh, Germany shifting the Yukon military command from Stuttgart to Mons, I mean, you know, that just had a counterproductive uh, 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 effect. Uh, you have to sort of talk, uh, uh, if you like, constructively, politely to the Germans, but but sure, you know, not let them off the hook. I mean, I think it's going to be very important coming back to reaffirmation and a new strategic concept that, you know, the Germans clearly sign up again to the 2%. Uh, uh, lately, the Biden administration has been soft talking about, okay, you know, we can have capabilities, we can have have commitments as well as cash we, you know we accept that the criteria should be broader but at the moment you know the previous government uh, of Chancellor Merkel did accept to reach uh, 2% by 2030 uh, and uh, 1.5% of GDP on defence by the target date of 2024. Uh, and I think you know, in the new strategic concept, that commitment has got to be reiterated by the new government. Um, I think the if Olaf, Olaf Scholz uh, does emerge as the Chancellor, his leadership role is going to be fundamental. I mean, everything I know about him is that he's an Atlanticist, you know, he's made that clear on the campaign trail he's a nato believer uh you know he believes in a strong defense but he's going to have a coalition with possibly but first of all the fdp now the fdp the free democrats are atlanticists but they're also budget cutters uh and an fdp uh, economics or finance minister might start going around saying we don't want any of these expensive <clears throat> We don't want to replace the tornadoes uh, with the nuclear capability uh, because that's too expensive. Uh, you know, we, you know, we after COVID, uh, we've got to get the German budget back into balance, uh, and therefore defence is not our priority. And then you have the Greens, who of course come at this from a more ideological viewpoint, which is that you know they don't like nuclear weapons or they don't like military spending, and uh, they've certainly uh, rejected the two 
2%. Um, so it's not going to be easy for the Chancellor. And I think that, you know, a lot is going to depend upon his leadership, but a lot is going to depend upon the way the Allies deal with Germany in a way that, you know, doesn't seem to be bullying it, but nudges it towards its uh, 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 re responsibility. Yes, you're right. I mean, it was disappointing that the election campaign was so little focused on foreign policy. Uh, you know, the last TV debate, they mentioned it a little bit, but just to repeat the usual platitudes, uh, it's an issue that German parties have tended to shy away from in recent times, like Nord Stream 2, because they feel it's going to be uh, the, the divisive. But but so uh, this is kind of thing, I think, a big challenge for uh, you know, the transatlantic relationship in the, in the, in the years ahead. Uh, because as I say, if the Germans are absent, uh, it's going to not only compromise their security, but the security of uh, uh, the other NATO continental uh, countries too. And my last question, uh, Jamie, uh, since we are talking about the future, future of NATO, so let's talk about space a little bit, about space capabilities. Uh, uh, what we're watching uh, across the pond in the United States is the creation of US Space Force, space capabilities, space sensors, tests, experiments. There is a lot of talk about it. There is a lot of materials, a lot of reports. The Chinese are doing their stuff. The Russians have been historically quite good at it coming, you know, based on, on, on the Cold War capabilities. And it seems that in the modern warfare, it's very difficult to do anything without space-based uh, security sensors of, you know, assets. Yeah. Uh, and on, also on, on, on the flip side, there is this new space industry uh, popping out everywhere in the US, elsewhere. And there is this uh, French traditional old legacy uh, industry, space industry, while in Germany there is new space companies uh, trying to overcome all those old barriers of access to space and so on. So there are many counter uh, uh, interests and sort of there is a lot of going on, so to speak, without a clear picture where we're heading for within NATO, within Europe as per se. What is your take on that, uh, given everything I have just said and ev given everything that's going on of which you know well? Well, first of all, I'm delighted that NATO has finally uh, declared uh, space as a domain uh, of operations, uh, which it did in London uh, uh, at the end of uh, 2019. Uh, belatedly, but better late than never, because uh, it's been clear for some time that all future military operations will be won or lost uh, in space. Um, if you take the first Gulf War, you remember back in 1990, 1991, the US uh, fired about 10% of their weapons uh, using space based uh, assets, you know, satellite guidance, satellite navigation. By the time of the second Gulf War in, in 2003, that figure was at 65%, and today it would be up in the 70 the 80%. Um, uh, so uh, the dependency of uh, the NATO military uh, on space for things like meteorological uh, information, early warning of missile launches, tracking, targeting, uh, cloud data storage increasingly in space, uh, 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 the communications, secure communications, uh, all going through space. I mean, every time you do a banking transaction, uh, it's logged uh, from the point of view of timing because banking transactions are determined by timing uh, through, through, through space. Um, and uh, not only is the dependency growing, but the number of actors is increasing as well. I mean, a few years ago, it was just obviously the Soviet Union and the United States with the French with their Ariane rockets and a little bit of European participation. But now you see that, you know, Iran has launched uh, satellites, North Korea has tried to launch satellites. Uh, uh, you see that even uh, the United Arab Emirates has sent uh, a probe to land on Mars, not the moon, but Mars. Uh, India has recently launched an anti-satellite capability. So you're right, it's becoming much more accessible. Uh, 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 for a, a number of different states, both in terms of military use, but of course also in terms of commercial use as well. And you quite rightly mentioned the private sector. I mean, today NASA gets to the International Space Station, not on its own rockets, but by contracting to Egon Musk, uh, who provides private sector 
uh, rockets and pilots to take NASA to the space station. So you're right, it's developing very quickly. So there are two aspects to NATO here. I and mean, of course, one aspect is to see what are NATO's military requirements? Uh, what are the assets? Uh, how secure are those assets? Uh, are the state uh, uh, sort of satellites uh, very expensive, very sophisticated, but increasingly vulnerable? Uh, recently, Russia, for example, frightened the French and the Italians by uh, maneuvering one of its Cosmos uh, satellites uh, very close to a Franco-Italian satellite, you know, demonstrating just how easily it could disrupt uh, that uh, uh, satellite. And we've seen, you know, states practicing, apart from anti-satellite weapons, you know, cyber attacks, spoofing, jamming, signal blockaging, uh, uh, blocking and so on. Spaces are still uh, very vulnerable to that. So um, one of the things that NATO needs to look at is uh, what are its requirements and what is the best solution? It seems to me, to answer your question, Yasek, that increasingly the answer is going to be lots and lots and lots and lots of very cheap, very quickly launched private sector satellites, uh, rather than a, a small number uh, of extremely, extremely sophisticated, extremely expensive satellites uh, up at 36,000 kilometers uh, in geostationary orbit that we've depended upon in the past. And that was lower space where the private sector is operating, where the activity is going to take place, is going to be more important than outer space. And um, it's rather like drones. It's the same sort of principle. You know, the United States has recognized, like many of us, that for the price of an F-35 joint strike fighter, you can buy literally hundreds of drones. No pilot, uh, they fire missiles, they can be very effective, they're also very stealthy. But if you lose one, no problem. You can yeah. quickly put another one. And up. no political uh, the strings, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. So I think that it's going to be swarms. You're going to have you know, lots of very, very cheap uh, vehicles produced by the private sector that can be quickly reconfigured, that if some are shot down, others can quickly replace them. So it, it means a different approach, much more dependent upon civilian technology, much more dependent on uh, uh, the private uh, sector, uh, much more dependent on the surge capabilities. Uh, the second aspect, very briefly, because space is a topic that's so important that we could have our entire conversation on it, but NATO mustn't just do the capability side. Space is the wild, wild west. Uh, uh, there's a treaty going back to the 1960s, the Outer Space Treaty, which says you cannot put nuclear weapons in space, but you can put any other type of weapon in space. Uh, we've got the problem of anti-satellite weapons. So there's a need for arms control. There's a need for regulation. Secondly, space is like the car being invented but there are no roads, no traffic lights, no police, no speed sure. limit, and you could drive on the left or the right as you please. So we badly need an international system for traffic in space to avoid the inevitable collisions, uh, to av avoid disruptions. And again, those rules of the road are something that we should work on. So to finish, it's rather like cyber. Uh, you know, you need to develop your capabilities, but you can't neglect the sort of the ecosphere of, of the norms, the laws, the rules, the regulations that, that, that apply, uh, which uh, constrain your adversaries uh, from uh, taking advantage uh, militarily uh, of, of space in, in, in the future. So NATO needs to be a good diplomatic actor, a good military actor. I mentioned earlier that the French have offered NATO a, uh, a, a space center of excellence uh, at Toulouse, uh, where they have their space industry. And it's going to be interesting to see what kind of uh, studies and recommendations it comes out with uh, over the next few years. I fully concur with uh, everything you have said about space. It's a fascinating topic that will probably cover a lot of our future, also in the context of NATO and its capabilities and the warfare. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jamie. Our, our guest today uh, was uh, Professor Jamie Shia, as you could, could have heard, uh, you know, a, a great interlocutor, uh, experienced uh, observer of life and uh, security uh, environment. Uh, thank you again, uh, and you stay with us uh, for more episodes, uh, more to come. Thank you. That was Jacek Bartosiak, Strategy in Future. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you again. Good day. <laughs>